The COVID pandemic has hit nearly every sector of society. Now, an award-winning recording artist has come out of quarantine with inspiring new music. Harry Connick Jr. talks about his brand new album, Alone With My Faith. Later, what did Pope Francis achieve for the Christian community in Iraq during his recent visit? And communist authorities tighten their grip on Chinese society. The Hudson Institute's Nina Shea is here with analysis. Actor and philanthropist Gary Sinise updates us on his foundation's work serving our nation's veterans and first responders. The World Over begins right now. Now, Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Harry Connick Jr., Nina Shea, and Gary Sinise are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Let's start. He's a singer-songwriter who sold over 30 million albums worldwide, winner of three Grammys, two Emmys, not to mention multiple Tony nominations for his work on Broadway. My next guest used the COVID isolation for inspiration, quite literally. He joins me tonight to talk about his brand new album, Alone With My Faith, out March 19th. Please welcome back to the program, my fellow New Orleanian, Harry Connick Jr. Harry, great to be with you. It's good to be with you too, thanks for having me. Hey, great to have you back on the show. I'm upset we can't do this in person, but before we get to the new album, Alone With My Faith, how has this pandemic affected you personally? It had to be rough not having that audience in the band within reach or and regular contact. You know, to be quite honest with you, as much as I love music and I love my band, the last thing on my mind is is performing. You know, what was really tough is, you know, the, the loss. Um, lost a lot of people in my friend and family circle over the last year and, and you know, not being able to celebrate their lives or you know, grieve in a, in a normal way has been has been pretty tough. But that said, it's been um, a year of unexpected surprises and blessings. So it's been unusual, but but it's uh, it's turned out pretty well in many ways, too. Mm -hmm. You did stay connected to your audience through your hunker down with Harry episodes on YouTube. I've seen a few of those. How how did producing those episodes keep you grounded? Um. I think that I didn't need to be kept grounded. I mean, it was, it was you know, a pandemic. So, you know, nobody was thinking about anything except, you know, the, the, the safety and, and well-being of, of others. Uh, I, I just wanted to do something that maybe gave people a little bit of a break, gave them some, um, some entertainment. Because at that time, you know, last March, you know, nobody really knew what was happening. So I right. figured, let me, let me do something in real time, um, with with people asking questions and giving them some entertainment that was that was specially made for them and and uh, I just hope that for the people who saw it it gave them a little bit of a break maybe some comfort. Yeah, yeah, no. Well, it was again that connection is important. I think particularly when people were so at sea during the early days of this pandemic. At what point did you start feeling the inspiration to record this new music? And did you know right away what you wanted to record? Well, I knew I, I always wanted to do a gospel album just because I love so many of those great songs. And I never really mm -hmm. got around to it because there were, there's a lot of other things I want to do, too. So when I got home, I have a studio at home and I have a lot of instruments that I've collected over the past 30 years. And I thought, well, maybe this is a good time to do that. So I started recording some familiar songs like um, Old Rugged Cross and Amazing Grace. And then I started thinking, well, what about writing some music that describes how I'm feeling right now. And to be quite honest with you, sometimes um, I, I, I felt okay. And other times I, I was questioning a lot of things. And so I wrote about faith from many different perspectives. And so this album turned into an album of faith uh, as opposed to just a, a Christian gospel album. Although it does have Christian songs on it, it's really an album that's made for for me to help me get through this time and and to give some some folks out there uh, a little peace of mind too. 
Mm -hmm. Well, look, uh, what I love about it is you set up all your own microphones, you played all the instruments, acted as your own engineer. I mean, Paul McCartney did something similar with his new album. Uh, and you recorded all of this uh, uh, at a time when you know everybody's broken up, you can't get together, you can't come together. And for a musician, that interplay and collaboration really is at the heart of what you do. Um, by doing this all yourself, was this just a function of lockdown or was it by design? Because it is so intimate and the whole album feels very intimate here. Well, it is really intimate and, and it, is, it, it's, um, it happened as a result of not being able to communicate with anyone, uh, which is why there were no other musicians here or you know, no recording engineer. But you know, I, I played solo mm -hmm. so much my whole life that it feels real comfortable to me. I've never done an entire mm -hmm. album where I do everything. I've done songs in the past where, you know, I put 30 vocals down or I uh, play all the instruments on a song here or there. But this was the first time when I literally did everything. And, and that was uh, mm -hmm. only because there was no other option. And I'm, I'm glad I had a chance to do it because I don't know, you know, when that time would have come. Right. Why Songs of Faith and Devotion? And what inspired you to explore this sacred ground? Was it because of that, um, the isolation that you and so many of us were going through, that it caused introspection and you thought, this is where I should be focusing my musical energies now? I thought so, you know, pretty much. I, I think that's the reason because, you know, as, as I was going through it, just like you and everyone else, there, there were times for me that, that, that I really struggled. I mean, I think the, the amount of people that I lost that I know, family or friends over the last year is up to 14, um, most wow. of which were as a result of uh, complications from COVID. So there were many days where, you know, you, you, can't, you can't go to funerals, you can't do anything. So, so I, you yeah. know, I had a lot of time to think about my faith, about my spirituality, um, and it, it, it put my faith to the test in the best of ways, because those are the times when I really need it. So uh, it felt mm. natural for me to sing songs about it. And the songs that I was singing actually helped get me through, which is what they're designed to do. So it was it was an experience that probably wouldn't have happened otherwise. But I sure I'm glad it did. Yeah. I remember interviewing Aaron Neville years ago, and he said during his you know, battles with drugs, he would always sing Lovely Lady Dressed in Blue, and he'd sing it to himself. And it was a prayer that became, he said, medicine for my soul. You know, it, it, it soothed him through that rough patch. And it seems we all need that. Now, I want to give people a little taste of this album, Harry. Uh, this is the new single available now, Harry Connick Jr. singing Amazing Grace. Listen. It was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieve I pray in that grace appeared the hour I first believe Harry, you did everything here. You did vocals, you did drums at the end, their horns. Um, how did you pull all of this off? I mean, did you do, did, is this electronic or did you actually play the instruments themselves? Well, it was really important for me to use real instruments. Um, as we all know, like you can use garage band and there's fake trumpets and fake guitars, but I didn't do any of that. The trumpet you hear, the hmm. bass, the vocals, the guitars, the saxophones, the trombones, everything is a real instrument. And I started most of the time with a piano track, then I'd add bass and drums, and then I'd add the trumpet or the tenor or whatever mm -hmm. other instrument I was playing. Um, and it's a time-consuming process because you have to actually play the instrument, you have to 
make sure it sounds good on the microphone. Then you have to edit things together and mix it. And so it takes it takes a while. But uh, I loved every part of that process just because that's you know, that's what I do. Well, you're an orchestrator, you're a, you're a, a composer. I mean, it, it it does tax all of your talents here. And you're pulling from a new place in this album, I have to say, just listening and having listened to you for a long time. There's no shortage of Amazing Grace covers out there. Why did you decide to do that song at this time, as well as Panos Angelicus, which you end the album with? Well, I did Panos Angelicus because my dad told me to. <laughs> He said, you're going to record <laughs> a good Panos Angelicus on the album? I'm like, of course I am. I had always planned on that. And <laughs> I hadn't planned on it, but I'm, I'm glad I did it. Um, Amazing Grace was one of the ones that just popped into my mind. I figured even though I couldn't be with people and, and um, <clears throat> couldn't really talk about what was going on, th this song is a song that everyone knows. And I thought that would kind of bring us together to sort of balance out some of the new songs. Um, but as far mm -hmm. as the other songs like Old Rugged Cross, I just love that song. My stepmom, Londa, asked me if I was recording old, old Time Religion, and I said, of course I am, but I hadn't planned on that one either. Um, so a couple of them were, were because I had some, some people in my life that suggested them that wanted to hear them. Tell me about the originals. Where did they come from? What's your favorite? I think my favorite is the title track, Alone With My Faith. This song came uh, because I was alone, but I felt like I had my faith with me, so that made it a lot easier. Um, there are certain lines in there like, um, I gotta work a little harder right now, I gotta little, dig a little deeper. Um, I don't have all the answers, but I've always known that I'm eternally faithful, so I'm never alone. I just wrote how I felt and how I felt other people might feel, and I think, um, I think that kind of sums up the whole, the whole uh, feeling of this album. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's real and essential, and it feels, uh, it's something we need. It lifts, it lifts spirits as well as acknowledges what we've all lived through and continue to live through. What elements make a great song, Harry? You just did a Broadway show uh, right before this pandemic dedicated to the music of Cole Porter. Um, tell me about not only the songs you selected for that show, but how you choose the songs for all your albums. What makes a great song for Harry Connick? That's a, that's a great question. Um, for me, th there's there's three basic components to it. There are the lyrics, mm -hmm. there's the melody, and then there are the harmonies or the chords that go with them. The lyrics and the melody are the most important things. And um, I think um, making uh, writing a melody that's singable and and something that you can remember is 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 a good quality. Um, having lyrics that, that can touch you emotionally or maybe make you laugh or cry or, or th there's some wit involved, you know, it just depends on the type of song. The, the reason Cole Porter was so great, among many reasons, is, is he wrote both the words and the music, but, but his right. songs were always a little bit different. He, he did things in unorthodox ways that, that made them interesting and made them kind of uh, more, more memorable. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, you're talking about one of the great songwriters of, of all time. So, you know, I can only dream of being able to, to, to write songs on that level. But he was, he was amazing. It was, it's a thrill to sing his songs. Yeah. In, in that album and in this current album, in fact, I'd go back to your Christmas albums and say the same thing. When you orchestrate a song, there are strong and complex counter melodies. Uh, beneath them that that even musicians say wow you know this and they're they're subtle but the, it, it's this is complex your orchestrations are not ba -da, ba -da, ba -da, ba -da. I mean you don't you know write the expected how taxing is that where does that come from and why create those strong counter melodies in an orchestration well, let me compliment you on the question. That, that's it's it's you know it's amazing that that you know you you would ask that um, for your viewers who who may not know. It, it's kind mm -hmm. of like um, writing the other half of a conversation. You have the melody, you have the lyrics, mm -hmm. and what can I do to 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 accompany that? What kind of melodies can I write in addition to the melodies, or what kind of chords can I put, or what kind of instrumentation? You know, is it going to be brass mm -hmm. or strings or woodwinds? Um, in terms of where it comes from, it's not taxing. It's just about identifying with 
who I am and not trying to be anybody else. I've, I've, I've studied the music of Duke Ellington and Nelson Riddle among Quincy Jones. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's about what is the song trying to say? And I, I heard somewhere that my arrangement of In the Still of the Night was bothersome to this one particular person. And she said that mm. the song is called In the Still of the Night. And you have this giant <clears throat> big band section in the middle. Do you not know what the song means? And I, I didn't respond, but my answer would be, in the still of the night, this person is going insane, uh, you know, mm. wondering if the person that he loves is reciprocating his love, which is why the thoughts been out of control and it and it bursts into this thing. It's not really about the still of the night. It's about losing your mind, wondering if that person loves you. So I think about what the lyrics mean, and I start with a blank page. I don't know what the tempo is going to be. I don't know what the key is going to be. I don't know what the groove is going to be. Is it going to be a ballad? Is it going to be up tempo? And then I just start thinking of stuff, and you know, and then it eventually takes takes shape. And then you have the ability to go back and and edit it and and refine it. Mm -hmm. you, you've called the experience of working on this current album um, a, a musical isolation chamber or a silent retreat. And I want to tie this to what you were just saying. Did this deepen your faith, your Catholic faith in particular, working on these songs in that isolation chamber? Such a, it's another great question. It, it does. It really is like a retreat. It's like, it's like a retreat where you go there to exercise the gift that you've been given by God that compels you to communicate with him. And when I was alone, and, and, and when you sing on a hill far away, stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame, when you sing that, and then you sing it again, and you sing it again, you, you really start to, to feel it. It takes, takes you over. And I think that mm -hmm. feeling is a deepening of faith because I'm, I'm singing about something that's referring to faith and I'm feeling more connected to God. And I think that's what's happening. I think, I think that is actually a deepening of faith. It's a, it's a, it's a real time confirmation of what the song is about. So yeah, I think, I think it is a, mm -hmm. a deepening of, of faith. Well, and, and I would argue, and you mentioned it a moment ago, when you're working, you know, when you look at that blank page and you're crafting a, an orchestration and taking something so established and known in the public's mind and you're refashioning it and working it through your own experience, that, that itself is its own retreat. I mean, I know from working on books, you, you get into that zone and then there's Same the thing. stuff you never planned for, Harry. There's the, you know, the Holy Spirit, yep. if I could give it a name. Um, and that's what I hear in between that's the cracks the of this album. You know, you, you're articulating it far more eloquently than, than I could. It's, it's exactly right. My dad has dedicated his life to understanding the Holy Spirit and written a thing called the Spiritual Mysteries, um, and it's amazing. And that's, that's what I think it is. It's like that little tap mm -hmm. on your shoulder that maybe yep. says, hey, write this down. You know, it's got to come from somewhere. And, and I, think yep. that's, I think that's what it is. Now, you got to the point in this album where you were ready for the final mix, but you didn't do that in your house. You rented an RV, you drove home to New Orleans to do the final mix. Why was it important for you to finish Alone With My Faith here in our hometown of New Orleans? Because I, I realized my limitations and a mixing engineer is a, is a, a, is a skill set that I do not possess. So. Uh, my, my good friend, Tracy Freeman, with whom I went to uh, Jesuit High School, lives probably five minutes from where you're sitting right now in Metairie, and he <laughs> um, is, a, is a brilliant uh, mixing engineer. So I said, Tracy, I'm going to drive down, I'm going to get tested, and I'm going to go into your studio, and we're going <laughs> to mix this thing. And, and that's, you know, that, that's beyond, you know, my job description. So I was glad to have Glad to have Tracy in my life to make it sound like a record. Well, and in the place where all that faith originated in many ways for you. Uh, so I, I, I loved that, yep, that there was absolutely. that local touch. 
Speaking of New Orleans this year, for, for many, this was the first Mardi Gras that was essentially canceled. Now, I know the mayor's office said it wasn't canceled, but the fact is we didn't have parades. We didn't do anything. Uh, you were one of the founders of the crew of Orpheus, which I've ridden in. How did this absence of Mardi Gras, Harry, affect you? People outside of New Orleans don't fully understand this, what it means to us and the rhythm of life. I think, you know, if I missed Mardi Gras because of a personal issue or if you missed it because of a personal issue, it would be disappointing. Come back next year. But the fact that we all missed it, it's kind of OK. I mean, I know there's varying opinions about Mayor Cantrell and how she's handled the situation. I, for one, support her because we have to stop this, this virus. I mean, it's hard on everyone, it's, it's mm -hmm. especially the people who are out there in the front lines and the essential workers. But, you know, yep. we're, I believe we're going to make it through. But, but you know, you, you, you can't have Mardi Gras. And it is what it is, man. You know, we, we, we're, we're, we're OK. You know, we made it. it. You know, we would love to go out there and, and party. But, you know, I think for, for everyone's benefit, it's probably best that we sat that one out, you know. OK, well, hopefully we'll all get back together this upcoming year, Harry. At least that's my hope. Uh, before I go I very so. quickly, I, I couldn't leave without mentioning uh, a, a friend of both of ours, um, New Orleans jazz icon Ellis Marcellus, really the patriarch of jazz here in uh, New Orleans. He was one of those whose lives were claimed by COVID over the last year. I know he meant a great deal to you personally. Very quickly, what did he teach you as a mentor, as a musician? So much. I mean, if you if you extract all of the the musical stuff and put that aside, just who he was as a man um, and mm -hmm. and the type of work ethic that he instilled in me. I mean, I got a lot of that from my parents, um, but r r specifically regarding music, nobody worked harder than Ellis. Um, and then you look at his sons, Wynton and Branford, um, unbelievable work ethic. So I, you know, the the idea that. Um, I mean, this this guy this guy gave up going on the road with Earth, Wind, and Fire to be a jazz musician in 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 New Orleans and raise six kids. Yeah, he he's, he he was an amazing man. I think about him every day, and I'm so honored that we have the Ellis Marsalis Center for Music to carry on his name and his legacy because he was he was so dear to me and you and the city of New Orleans. And yeah. you know, I look forward to seeing Ellis monuments all over New Orleans and you know, Ellis Marsalis Avenue and stuff like that. I agree. Hear, hear. Okay, we will leave it there, Harry. The new album, Alone With My Faith, it really does feel like a retreat, uh, but a j very joyous one and a, an intimate uh, personal one in so many ways. It hits stores Friday, March 19th. The new single, Amazing Grace, is available now on Apple Music, Spotify, all the usual outlets. Harry, my friend, thanks for being with us. We'll do it again soon, hopefully in person. I hope so. You're a really smart guy and a sensitive guy, and, and I, I really enjoyed our time together. Thanks for having me back. Me too. See you soon. Bye, Harry. I am so excited. My new picture book, The Thief Who Stole Heaven, is now in bookstores everywhere. It's release week. It's the origin story of The Good Thief, Dismas, that you probably have never heard. I certainly hadn't. It's based on the writings of saints, a redemptive visual tale of adventure for the whole family. It makes a wonderful Easter gift as well. A recent review called it Aladdin Meets the Chosen. Take a look at the trailer. Now you can get an autographed edition of The Thief Who Stole Heaven from the EWTN 
catalog. I posted the link on my Facebook page at RaymondArroyo.com. The Thief Who Stole Heaven is available in stores online now. You can get your copy, EWTN's catalog, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, wherever books are sold. Visit DiscoverLegends.com or my website for more information. Pope Francis just became the first leader of the Roman Catholic Church to ever visit Iraq. What lasting effect will this trip have in the region? and for Christian minorities there. And as the Chinese communists continue to crack down on religious and human rights, what should the U.S. response be? Joining me to talk about this and much more is director of the Center for Religious Freedom at the Hudson Institute, Nina Shea. Nina, the Pope's four-day visit to Iraq was intended to encourage the Christian population there, who have been, as you know, as we've been reporting for years, decimated by the war as well as the, uh, the, the, uh, the splintering of society. The Pope was also there to nurture ties with Shiite Muslims. Speaking to a packed church of the Immaculate Conception on Sunday, Pope Francis had this to say to the Christian community, the road to full recovery may still be long, but I ask you please not to grow discouraged. What is needed is the ability to forgive, but also the courage not to give up. Iraq has seen its ancient Christian population shrink drastically, Nina, by about 83 percent since the U.S.-led invasion toppled Saddam Hussein in 2003. Now, given the current climate in the country, is it possible for Christians to return to their homeland? And how do you think Pope Francis's words resonated with them? Well, I think that the visit was extremely important to the people there. I'm hearing from the Christians in Iraq that it meant a lot to them, a lot in terms of solidarity and encouragement. And what it needed to do and what it can do is instill in them a sense of mission that they are there as a continuous representation of the earliest churches. Their faith came down to them only decades after uh, Jesus's uh, death uh, by St. Thomas and uh, the apostle. And um, so they have this patrimony, the spiritual patrimony that's important uh, to all of us, to the world, that they remain in the cradle of Christianity this continuous indigenous Christian presence. And mm -hmm. he did uh, make statements about that, that they are a martyred church, that they have been persecuted, that they had a special role in the cradle of Christianity. Um, at, at his first appearance in the Church of Our Lady of Salvation in Baghdad. And that was at a site of the genocide. That was at the beginning of the genocide. That was even before ISIS, Raymond, in 2010, mm -hmm. when 58 uh, worshipers, a Catholic, Syriac Catholics in that church were either all killed or maimed, including uh, the death of the martyrdom of two priests at that time during mass. And so this was not lost on them that they, um, and I think that, you know, there were, there were descriptions of, of women weeping inside the church. Some of them had been there that day when that bomb went off. So, um, and, and that was deliberate by Islamic extremists. He mentioned the terrorism that they had suffered and that this was preventing coexistence. So I don't think that appeals to just simply stay or that, don't pay attention to the money in the West that you could make there, or, well, don't mind the lack of security here um, for the short term or medium term. Um, it, it, you know, that I think that will, that the only thing that would resonate and has resonated with them is this sense that they have a very spe special mission and role to play in the worldwide church. Mm -hmm. On Saturday, Pope Francis met with the Grand Ayatollah Ali al-Sistani. Now, he's the preeminent religious figure for Iraqi Shiites. Uh, the Pope then visited the site of the ancient city of Ur, believed to be the birthplace of the prophet Abraham. Uh, how significant was this meeting, Nina? And what message did that visit with the Grand Ayatollah send to Shiite Muslims in the region? Will it make a difference? Well, um, it is very significant. Significant. He's a very revered Ayatollah Sistani. Um, the Christians, they are now, uh, their biggest um, threat is from Shiite militias. Uh, these were militias that are funded by Iran, backed by Iran. They're taking their land. There's other Shiite uh, extremists 
in Baghdad even who are um, taking properties of Christians. So what the Pope was trying to um, say was, uh, the Pope was saying is that there must be peaceful coexistence. You must ex uh, respect the rights of all people of Iraq. Um, there's equal dignity in everyone. Uh, so this was an important message for him to convey as the voice of uh, a stature in the in the Christian world. He was mm -hmm. is able to draw attention to the fact that there are problems with coexistence, even with the majority Shiites in Iraq today, not just mm -hmm. the problems with ISIS that is more or less in the past. Nina, during the visit and afterward, the Pope has questioned who is selling the armaments to these terrorists? I want to know who's supplying them with the weapons. He keeps asking that question. What do you think he's getting at there? And who do you think is selling them the weapons and providing the weapons to the to these terrorists, ISIS and others uh, in the region? The, the Shia terrorists are coming and militias are, the weapons are coming and money is coming from Iraq and maybe, I mean, from Iran and maybe even some in Iraq. Um, it, the Sunnis is another case that's coming from um, any number of Sunni powers or their populations in the Gulf, in Saudi Arabia, in Qatar, mm -hmm. in you know from Turkey. Um, there's any number of threats. Security is going to remain a serious problem in Iraq for years to come. You know, part right. of this, Raymond, we've talked about this before, is the decision of the George W. Bush administration to go in there and right. invade against Pope John Paul II's recommendation and urging not to. Um, and, and the local Chaldean is, church, as we covered at the time, Nina, you'll remember, uh, you know, we had the mm -hmm. Chaldean patriarchs on saying, please don't do this. We're OK now. We can hold the balance here. And they made another decision, which was ruinous for the region. It was ruinous. On Monday, Nina, the White House hailed the Pope's trip as a symbol of hope for the entire world. Now, the U.S. continues to target or be a target rather in Iraq, both from within the country and from Iran. What is the U.S. doing to help the minorities in this country, Christians and Yazidis, who have endured genocide over the last decade? That's been a continuing problem because uh, the U.S. has mostly ignored them. Um, during the last couple years, under the Trump administration, there was a, a very serious effort to get these Christians some help, along with the Yazidis, mm -hmm. who were also victims of genocide. And both of these groups were pronounced genocide by the Obama administration, uh, back right. in 2016, but 2017, but they they did not um, they did not help them. They did not get the aid to them. The aid went to the UN. The UN did not share it with these survivors of genocide, the minority survivors. So helping them rebuild their places um, is is going to be extremely important in the months and years mm -hmm. to come. The Iraqi government has passed a bill, uh, including Yazidis as well as Christians, in some restitution. As a result, they're saying of the Pope's visit, uh, it had been hung up for a while in their legislature. It looks like that moved forward. So we have one tangible uh, forward-moving gesture there, at least on the part of the Iraqi government. That's a good thing. I want to move on to China. Every March, the Chinese authorities and President Xi gathered a rubber stamp policies approved by the Communist Party leadership. This year, one of the top priorities is to close down dissent in Hong Kong. Loyalty to China's Communist Party will be key to deciding if a Hong Konger is a, quote, patriot, a senior Chinese official said Tuesday. Now, the Chinese government says these new laws are needed to restore stability and plug loopholes that accommodate what they call anti-Chinese forces. Now, Nina, they used COVID to ram that security law through in Hong Kong. Is this the end of the pro-democracy movement and demonstrations that we've been seeing for years in Hong Kong? Um, I think it's part of this overall consolidation of totalitarian power, actually, by President Xi and the Chinese Communist Party. Mm. Uh, we're seeing a genocide in um, the Uyghur area of Xinjiang in the West. You have uh, the Hong Kong anti-democracy movement being crushed um, step by step. It's the beginning of the end. There, 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 there's mm. very little doubt about this. Um, the, the churches are terribly repressed. And there's going to be new laws there on May 1 um, enforced to repress the churches even further. Th these laws, uh, these new rules, Raymond, ban all people, all, ch all minors under the age of 18 from exposure to religion. 
uh, not just Christianity, right. but including Christianity. They can't go to Bible schools. They can't go to mass. They can't receive the sacraments. They can't be educated in the faith. Uh, what is that going to do the faith in a generation or two from now? Uh, they they force um, the the entire Catholic Church into the patri- so-called patriotic church, where they are supposed to uphold uh, the Communist Party principles. Mm-hmm. They there's no role for the Pope in the appointment of bishops under these new rules. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're, they're, I mean it's it's really troubling. And uh, look, this is another place where. Uh, the the previous administration, the Trump administration, uh, said there's a genocide going on here in China. Uh, this is apparently a designation that both uh, President Biden as well as Blinken, the uh, uh, Secretary of uh, State, has agreed with. Um, here's the question. There are now calls to boycott the Beijing Olympics in winter of 2022. What do you make of those calls? I think something uh, drastic like that has to happen. I would uh, prefer to see the, the, the Winter Olympics moved to another democratic country uh, so that mm-hmm. the athletes don't have to uh, pay the price for this. But um, it, it's how can you have an Olympic game celebrating and the world celebrating China uh, while there are in the backdrop concentration camps and a genocide taking place? Um, it, it's mm-hmm. unfathomable. And um, it would be, I feel, if the the world averts its eyes to what is obviously a genocide, which the U.S. government has declared it, Canada's parliament has declared it, other countries have, uh, the U.K.'s parliament is considering it now. So there there are a number of, uh, this is catching on. I don't see how uh, the the human rights uh, regime worldwide can even survive if this core principle of never again will we tolerate genocide um, mm-hmm. it goes by the wayside. If that is discarded, if we, the world averts its eyes, uh, human rights is finished. I agree with you. Yeah, but we, we hear that all the time. Never forget, never forget, never forget. Let's, let's, let's try to focus on where it's happening today and then take actions to stop it. And look, exempting ourselves from a games, an international games, or moving them to a different venue, as you're suggesting, seems to be the absolute minimum that these world powers and governments should be engaged in. They can't uh, certify and endorse what China's doing, and that's what going to those Olympics, I think, would mean. Now, moving on to Myanmar, uh, one month after the military coup, protests have grown enormous in that country. Hundreds of thousands of pro-democracy protesters have been fighting for the ousted president. Her supporters are being killed while vowing to push back against dictatorship. Your thoughts on what we're seeing there? And on Tuesday, a Catholic nun, Sister Anne Rose Newtong, uh, begged a group of heavily armed police to kill her and spare the children. The police were there to break up these pro-democracy protests. Uh, Your thoughts on what's happening there and where this could end? Yeah, it's very similar to what is happening in China. There is a a complete Mm -hmm. uh, cleansing of the ethnic minority, uh, uh, the uh, the Rohingya ethnic Muslim uh, minority community there. Uh, They've been through terror by the government and its military pushed out of the country. Half of them have been pushed out, or more than half. Um, And and then there's um, actually that nun, uh, Anne Rose, she is from Kachina, which is another area, and uh, Kachin, and and that is an ethnic group that has many Christians in it. And 300 churches have been destroyed or burned there Um, again, by government supporters uh, over the last 10 years. There's been uh, a great deal of intolerance uh, by the government itself, as well as some fanatics in the Buddhist community um, against these non-Buddhist minorities. There's what Mm. is called a Burmanization of uh, Myanmar, making it more uh, ethnically and religiously uh, uniform by this repression. Mm. In 2015, Pope Francis elevated Archbishop Charles Bow, uh, the cardinal, he made him a cardinal, the first in that country's history. In a statement last month, Bo said, you are in this plight in your unending struggle to bring democracy to this nation. The unexpected turn of events has made you prisoners. We pray for you and urge all concern to release you 
at the earliest. Now, Catholics make up only 1% of the population uh, in this country of 54 million, and it borders China, Laos, uh, Thailand, Bangladesh, India. How vulnerable are they, Nina? Well, they're very vulnerable. Um, and I, I want to just say that Cardinal Bo is an incredible hero, incredible uh, church leader. Uh, Raymond, he has just called today for prayers for the Chinese church, even though he's himself, and he says this in his statement, is from Myanmar, from Burma, and his country's going through these these horrible uh, challenges and troubles and persecutions and genocide, frankly, against the Rohingya Muslims. Um, he is calling for worldwide week of prayer um, to Our Lady of the Help of, of Christians um, in May, uh, from May 23rd to May 30th. He's calling for lay people to take this up in their churches and for all people of goodwill to pray for uh, the Church of China and for all peoples of China. Um, so he is an amazing leader, and um, I hope your uh, viewers will follow suit in that, and I hope that the priests in the parishes will do that as well. Um, yeah. And I think prayer for these persecuted Christians, whether they're in Myanmar or Iraq or in China, is exactly what is needed. And we need to be doing that um, in our churches weekly, not not just mm -hmm. once a year or once a papal visit. Mm -hmm. So this is extremely I important. I agree. The U.S. has imposed sanctions on uh, uh, Myanmar, uh, and they've asked China to help end that coup. Will this work, and does it further complicate the U.S. ability to be critical of China when it comes to the human rights record? Well, I think it's uh, absurd to think that China would—China's you know, basing it, it, its own defense on don't interfere with the internal affairs of this country. Stay away from what we're doing. Stay out of it. It's none of your business. Mm -hmm. um, for what we're doing to our people in Hong Kong or in, um, you know, the, the Muslim region. Um, so why would they get involved in Burma to uphold human rights for a Muslim ethnic group? I mean, the parallels are right. so striking that they would right. never do this in a million years. So uh, I think that's useless. Um, definitely we should be cutting off and the world should be cutting off any kind of help to this military government there in Burma. No. No, I think China's the last place you want to turn for religious and human rights relief. I mean, they, there was a report I read where it was a, a small home church. Uh, the cops, the, the, the Chinese minders, had been watching it. They infiltrated the church. They wanted the locals to give up the names of all the members. Uh, arrests have been made. This goes on all the time, Nina. And frankly, we don't cover it enough. It gets virtually no coverage here. And it seems the noose is tightening on the faithful in China with this ongoing regulation, uh, the, the mandate that you must be authorized and part of the official Chinese church. And now your tenants of faith have to comport with Chinese thought, meaning the Communist Party mindset. That's right. There's only one ideology permitted, that is communist um, ideology. Mm -hmm. uh, the churches, that's the real reason why the churches and the Muslims and the Tibetan Buddhists and the Falun Gong, every single one of them are being shut down, crushed, constrained and turned into really propaganda, propaganda centers um, or surveillance centers for the Communist right. Party it's because they will not tolerate any uh, competition of ideas. Before I let you go, are you stunned that the Vatican hasn't spoken out more forcefully or at all about the state of those religious believers in China? I am. Um, I, I am stunned that they have not even mentioned that there's a threat to the Chinese language Bible. The government is, uh, is in the process of re translating it or reinterpreting it, mm -hmm. of course, according to Chinese Communist Party principles, that they, I am stunned that they have not said a word about the fact that young people under the age of 18 will not be allowed, to, are not allowed to be exposed to religion or to receive the sacraments. I mean, that is uh, just, uh, I don't know what they think is going to happen in the next generation. There won't be any uh, priests. There won't be any faithful in the pews um, in a generation right. or two if this continues. And this was a church that was growing and booming. 
um, and it's the brakes are on it, it's re going to reverse. We're going to see that happening. Wow. Uh, the Office of International Religious Freedom, before I let you go at the State Department, an office you are most familiar with, uh, there's no ambassador at large at present. Sam Brownback held that position under the Trump administration. Now, a senior State Department <laughs> official is running the office, I guess, temporarily. Does this position need to be filled by the Biden administration? And does there need to be a greater focus on international religious freedom from this administration? I have a minute, Nina. Uh, yes, uh, they need to appoint someone. They need to show that they are concerned about this, and that this is institutionalized within the State Department and within our foreign policy. Um, I have a deep fear, Raymond, that um, that the green uh, policy, the green energy, that uh, climate change is going to be traded off. That 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 that, that human rights and religious freedom are going to be traded off for for those goals. That we're going to partner with China. That we're going to have um, confidence-building measures with China on green uh, agenda issues. And those confidence-building uh, measures for Beijing is going to be no silence on what is happening on human rights and human dignity and religious freedom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it looks like the administration is already prioritizing that green agenda, a gender agenda, as putting that on the forefront of foreign policy. And uh, Christian persecution, religious rights are sort of put on the back burner, if at all. Nina Shea, we will leave it there. We'll certainly check in with you in the days ahead. Nina's reporting on the persecution of Christians all over the globe can be found at Hudson.org. Nina Shea, thank you for being here. Thank you, Amen. He's an award-winning actor, musician, and philanthropist working on behalf of our nation's fighting men and women. Despite the economic and societal lockdowns due to COVID, he and his foundation have soldiered on to provide assistance to our veterans and first responders. I spoke to him recently about this important work, and he shared with me some beautiful stories of hope. Here's my interview with Gary Sinise. <laughs> Gary, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Raymond. Always good to be with you. Your foundation does such incredible work for veterans. How has COVID-19 affected the work of the foundation? Has it slowed it down at all? It, it really has not uh, slowed us down. It just kind of made us pivot uh, a little bit mm. uh, to a new area. We wanted, to, we wanted to play a positive role in helping people through this pandemic. Back in March, we all found out about this. And, and uh, on April 1st, we launched an initiative called the Emergency COVID-19 Combat Service. Mm -hmm. We started raising additional money so that we could provide uh, PPE to departments all over the, the country, meals, all kinds of things. We've uh, we raised about $1.4 million. We continue to do that. Uh, we provided over 60,000 meals to VA centers, hospitals, uh, veterans around the country, um, medical workers mm -hmm. were supporting in various areas. We've, we've impacted probably, you know, over, over 8 million people in different ways with, uh, wow. you know, obviously we had to go into sort of a work from home mode. Everybody, we, we kept everybody away from the office, but we have a tremendous team that, that really just jumped on this mission and continued to operate all our programs at the same time, but adding the COVID-19 combat service on top of that. Hmm. And we've really played, uh, I think, a significant role in just helping people deal with this pandemic and get through it. The medical workers alone, I mean, we're supporting hospitals yeah. all over the country as well. Gary, relative to that, uh, I wanted you to talk for a moment about your partnership with the uh, National World War II Museum and the Higgins Hotel here in New Orleans. Uh, you supported first responders right here, doctors and healthcare workers, nurses at the New Orleans VA hospital. Uh, it's part of that Serving Heroes initiative you mentioned a moment ago. Um, how did this come about? And would you talk about how important this kind of support is now in a time of these rolling quarantines and lockdowns? Yeah, Raymond, Serving Heroes is just a, it's a program, it kind of organically happened. Years years ago, before I even had a foundation, I would uh, pop into a USO center or something like that, ask them if I could buy meals for, for the troops that were coming through the centers. I started doing that, and then when we uh, launched the Gary Sinise Foundation in 2011, we created a program to support USO centers around the country, VA, hospitals, 
and whatnot. We just provide these meals for them. But more importantly to me, it's it, it was a way to remind our troops at home and abroad on military bases and at, at military hospitals all around the country and overseas that we do not forget what they're going through. You know, they can they can have food, of course, but uh, what we send them is a message from the American people who support the Gary Sinise Foundation. Uh, thousands and thousands of donors help us do this good work. And we get to pass on their generosity uh, all across the country, serving heroes. We ramped up in a big way after COVID-19. We started supporting over 80 different VA centers around uh, the country, wow. providing meals to, to patients and to staff alike who are dealing with this fan pandemic. And when you, when you roll in with a great barbecue or something like that, it can really lift those spirits up. It can remind people that what they're doing is important and that we don't take it for granted. So it's a it's a great program, just one of our many programs at the Gary Sinise Foundation. I agree. No, the, the Gary Sinise Foundation also is famous for its support of our nation's wounded warriors, uh, particularly through your RISE program, which we've talked about before, restoring independence and supporting empowerment. Uh, that has continued to change lives for injured vets and their families. You recently donated your 65th special home to one of our wounded heroes, retired Army Captain Greg Galeazzi in Boston. Tell us a little about this amazing story. Uh, yeah, Greg's an amazing, uh, amazing guy, uh, married to a wonderful woman, Jasmine. Um, we found out about him uh, a, couple of, a couple of years ago. He's a double amputee, um, lost his legs in a bombing. And uh, we wanted to do something special for him. He's, he's putting, he put himself through medical school. He's, uh, he's really kind of an amazing individual, powering through his disability and his physical challenge. And we wanted to play a, a role in helping him. So we provide these specially adapted smart technology homes that are specifically designed for each one of these uh, wounded service members challenges. And Greg, um, you know, every one of our homes, our RISE team, a great team of builders that we've uh, had on board for quite a while now, they've done dozens of these homes. They know how to go in there, sit down with the wounded service member, talk to them about the challenges that they've faced in their current housing situation and what they dream of uh, what the, to mm -hmm. make their lives more independent and easier. And so we uh, we were able to give that 65th home away to Greg and his family. Uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful day. We have a couple uh, couple more coming up for, uh, the rest of this year. We we're it's an ongoing program. You support the Gary Sinise Foundation at Gary Sinise Foundation dot org. And you can help change lives mm. for the better in in miraculous and wonderful ways. Gary, we, we cover such horrible things day in and day out, uh, particularly, uh, you know, from my vantage point. It's uh, and that's why I wanted to have you on, because though people give lip service to the veterans, it is rare that people actually do things or organizations do things to make their lives tangibly better. And that's really what you and the, the folks at your foundation do day in and day out, whether you're getting covered for it or not. And speaking of honoring veterans, you recently helped celebrate the birthday of America's oldest living World War II veteran from right here in New Orleans, uh, Private Lawrence Brooks. Now, on September 12th, he turned 111 years old. He served in the Army's predominantly black 91st Engineer Battalion. He's a great New Orleanian. Uh, we've got video of the festivities, which I'm going to show people uh, from his home, complete with a serenade by the Victory Bells, who are from the World War II Memorial uh, Museum here in town. How did you get to know Lawrence? You actually met him years ago when he was only 106. He was, he was a young man at the time that I met him, <laughs> uh, 106 years old. <laughs> uh, it was remarkable. We opened, uh, I've been involved with the World War II Museum now for many, many years. And in uh, 2015, they opened uh, the Road to Tokyo, a brand new mm -hmm. exhibit there. And we, we provided funding and brought several World War II veterans there from around the country through our soar, uh, which was at that time, that year was our brand new Soaring Valor program. We've since sent hundreds and hundreds of World War II veterans to see the museum. But that's where I met Lawrence. We actually had, uh, it was at one of the performances of the Victory Bells. We, uh, you know, when we bring these veterans in, we always do a lunch for them and the Victory Bells uh, perform. And after they performed, they took me over and said, we want you to meet Lawrence Brooks. He's 106 years old. 
And it was remarkable to meet him. And many times since then, when I've gone down there with our Soaring Valor program, he he comes over to the to the museum. He's a, a you know a stable mm-hmm. at the museum, and they wanted to do something special for his 111th birthday. So we provided some funding for a, a, a major flyover of uh, warbirds that came o- right over his house. And uh, the Victory Bells came out there and sang, and it was just a wonderful thing. He's, he's seen so much in his life, uh, and, and, he's, and he's just a man who has great peace and love in his heart. I hope you get to meet him someday, uh, if you haven't already, Raymond. He's a no, I, I have guy. met him with the, the kids down at the museum one day. I, I, I met him years and years ago. And, you know, here's a guy who lived through the 1918 pandemic. And here he's surviving the latest one as well. That's a that's a pretty good <laughs> stretch uh, there. Amazing. man. <laughs> Mental health, Gary, is an important consideration this year in particular. Uh, what is the foundation doing to support the mental health uh, of our healthcare community, in our healthcare community, rather, for these first responders? They're going through a lot this time of year. Um, yes, quite, quite, quite a bit. This is a, a difficult time, obviously, for our medical workers and first responders. Everything we do at the, at the Gary Sinise Foundation, Raymond, the, the, the heart of it, the soul of it, the, the heartbeat of it is improving someone's mental health. It's making them feel better. And it all started when mm-hmm. I just volunteered to go to military bases and shake hands and take pictures and sign autographs. And then I started taking my band there to, to entertain them. It was all about lifting spirits, raising people up. So every one of our programs that we have at the Gary Sinise Foundation is about that. And, and what we're doing here by providing all these meals, thousands and thousands of meals to medical workers in hospitals all across the country is just to lift them up and let them know that what they're doing is important. It's valued. We don't take it for granted. It's a difficult time. We want them to feel better and we want them to know they're supported. So if you go to the Gary Sinise Foundation website, you check out the programs there. They are all about making somebody's life better today. And that's that's what mm. we do at the Gary Sinise Foundation. They sacrifice a lot for us. These are our defenders. These are our healthcare workers, our first responders, our firefighters, our police officers, our military personnel. They're all out there on the line doing the difficult and dangerous work to keep us safe and free and protected. So we want to give something mm. back to them. And you can do that at the Gary Sinise Foundation. Well, you and the foundation do such a beautiful job every year and day in and day out. And, uh, you know, we love the work of the Gary Sinise Foundation and love you. Uh, Our prayers are with you and your family. And you can learn more about the Gary Sinise Foundation. Go to GarySiniseFoundation.org. And Gary's recent memoir, Grateful American, A Journey from Self to Service, is still available at bookstores everywhere. Gary, thanks for being here. God bless you, Raymond. Thank you. The World Over is now available as a podcast. Download us at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Get your podcasts. Get your podcast. Take us with you wherever you go. That's all the time we have for now. Be sure to catch us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I thank you for joining us. I'm Raymond Arroyo. Bye now.